Hello, you're listening to a sermon from Community Church in Prague, Oklahoma. At Community Church, we are all about loving God as a community and loving people in our community. If you live in the area, we would love for you to join us on a Sunday morning for coffee and fellowship at 930 or for service at 10 a.m. And now here is our pastor, Wopsle, with part four of our Context Series. Today's the last week of our Context Series, and and what we've been doing is taking a look at a, a, a verse you may know or may have heard, but then we're looking at the context around it, the before and after, what it, what informs that one verse in a way that may make us think a little differently about it. If you've loved this series and feel like you learned a lot about what we've talked about, well, you're in luck. If, some of you may have noticed this. We pretty much teach like this every week, right? We always like really look at the context and figure out. So just because the context series is over doesn't mean we won't be looking at Jonah the same way we look at everything else. But here's the verse we're going to look at today that you may or may not have heard, and then we'll zoom out and look at the context. Galatians 6, verse 7 says this, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. Um, So let me give you uh, some background of what's going on here. Galatians was a letter written by a guy named Paul to a church, to a group of believers. And he's writing them to encourage them and kind of help them know how to live for God, right? Right? Um, I like to do this, I like to skim the chapter before the chapter I'm reading sometimes, um, because it, it helps with context, right? So uh, we're, I'm just going to skim these, this chapter 5. Actually, if you go all the way back to Galatians 4, this is just interesting, I think. There's this whole thing about Sarah and Hagar, Abraham's two women that he had sons with, and how one of those sons was the one of promise, and one is the one. It's really interesting if you were here all summer to study all of, Gala- all, all of, of Genesis with us. But then Galatians 5 has these headings and these, then these um, explanations. So here's the first heading in Galatians 5. It says, freedom in Christ. That's the heading. And then here's Galatians 5.1. It says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. So you see this freedom in Christ, this idea of like salvation and stepping out. You know, your chains are broken and now you're free to live for Christ. That's the first part of Galatians 5. Then about halfway through, the only other heading in Galatians 5 says, life by the Spirit. And at the end, Galatians 5 is a verse you probably are familiar with. Verse 22 and 23 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, or patience is probably what you know that is, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So just in Galatians 5, as we just glance back at these headings, we see this progression, right? We see newfound freedom in Christ, like salvation and life in Christ. And then we see this live life by the Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit kind of deal. That's a pretty natural progression, right? What most of us hopefully have experienced, new life in Christ, and now doing my best to live a life that's empowered by the Spirit. So if you were just thinking, well, what would be the third step then? What If someone was writing this letter, if someone was preaching this sermon, newly alive in Christ, the Holy Spirit equipping you to do good things through the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. Then if I was writing this sermon, the next thing I would do is, now you need to use those gifts for other people, right? Now it's time to serve. Now it's time to look outside of yourself. You weren't saved and gifted just for you, right? Uh, Blake's not good at the guitar just for him. He's actually good at the guitar uh, for, for the church's benefit, right? God gives you these gifts. So the third part of that story would be, Now go and think about other people. Well, guess what? Galatians 6, the heading, if you're in your Bible, you can look. The heading says, doing good to all. So again, if we just take these headings, freedom in Christ, living life by the Spirit, doing good to all. It's kind of a natural progression for this thing to go, right? So I think it's safe for us to assume that Galatians 6 is written to believers, to people who know God, who are following God, who are a part of this church, and now he's telling them, how can you do good to everybody? How can you use what God's done in your life to propel you to do good in other people's lives? So 6 one says this. We're not going to dig into it all this, this clearly, but we'll do it on 6.1. It says, he says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin... You who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. A lot of you probably like that verse until the gently part. (laughs) 
You're like, I should restore him. Oh, I've been dying. I'm ready to go in. I'm ready to swoop in. Tell him just how bad he is. Tell him just how terrible this thing she's done is. But no, it says that if you, if, if you have freedom in Christ, and if you've been gifted by the Spirit to do things, then you should, what should you do? You should gently work to restore the people that you are close enough to to do that. This goes a lot, remember a couple weeks ago, we talked a lot about um, restoring people gently. When we talked about do not judge, right? We should, we should restore the people Gently, not firmly, not in a, in a mad way, not in a way that pushes them further away. This Galatians six one, I think, is a really important verse for us to think about. That we get, we we get to, we have the privilege of helping our brothers and sisters, but we got to do it gently. Um, Galatians six one is, is one of the only verses that I think about literally every day. I have a computer wallpaper, and if you're like me, I look at my computer screen. 300 times an hour, right? And this is, I took a screenshot this week of, this is my computer screen. There's projects and stuff you can see there's, you know, not that, hopefully there's nothing embarrassing on there right now. Um, and Galatians 6, one. this is that verse in the message version, if you don't know, it's just kind of a very contemporary version. And this is all it says, live creatively, friends. And the reason that this is what I see every time I open my laptop, it's not because I want to be creative in the graphics that I make. I do. I make all of our graphics and videos and stuff, and I like being creative in that way. But this verse isn't telling me to be creative in what I create. This verse is telling me to be creative in the way that I lovingly and gently restore others back to the truth of the gospel, back in line with God's will for their lives. So every time I see my computer screen, I think, okay, how can I create, not how can I creatively like do something that will look cool or somebody will be like, well, that's neat. How can I creatively present this truth and live my life in a way to where somebody might be able to gently be restored in their relationship with Christ? That's where we got to get creative. And you may say, well, so I'm not very creative. You're made in the image of the creator, capital T, capital C. You are creative and you are equipped by the spirit to do creative things that will do good to all. If you have found freedom in Christ, then your next job is to creatively and gently restore others. We're going to kind of fly through this next part because I think it's interesting, but, but we'll, we'll dig into this maybe another time. Verses two through six say this. He says, again, this is Paul talking to believers, right? Mature believers who the Spirit's working through. He says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. So first of all, can we just agree that it's weird that verse 2 says carry each other's burdens and verse 5 said each one should carry their own load. It seems like he's kind of talking about two different things here. And I'm not going to preach that sermon because I couldn't figure out what that meant. But here's a few of the highlights here. He says things like carry each other's burdens, right? He says don't think too highly of yourself or you're fooling yourself. He says you should share the good things in your life with other people. So you see this makes total sense if we take this in line of Paul writing to mature Christians that are in the church that are doing, that should be doing everything they can to show the love of Christ to others and to gently restore others back into the fold. That all makes sense, that that's the context we're in. So then the next verse, when we return to the one we started with, is this. Verse 7, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. So apparently... Here, this is the part where we like to think that Paul is not talking about us. If this verse sounds familiar, um, the reason why we're doing this today is, again, way back at the Olympics, um, at the beginning, uh, they, they did this thing in the opening ceremony that a lot of people got really upset about. Uh, I won't say much more than that. And a lot of people that got upset about it shared this verse in connection with why they were upset about it. They were implying that um, the Olympics were mocking God. And they were saying, no, look at what this says. God cannot be mocked. So Olympics, you need to stop it. Listen, Olympics aren't Christian. Like they, they weren't, tr- I don't know what they were trying to do. That's not this soapbox. Sorry, let me just get off of that. People took this one verse completely without a context, without knowing who was talking, who they were talking to. They just said, I feel like they're mocking God. God cannot be mocked, everybody. God cannot be mocked. They, this verse must be talking about them. That's where everyone jumped to the conclusion, right? Let me, I got this book a couple years ago. Um, 
And it was right whenever we announced we were moving to Prague, and someone gave me this book. It's called Gentle and Lowly. I've got it up here, but you can see it better here. Um, and uh, oh, here, in the subtitle here is actually what I want to talk about. It's, it's kind of small up here, but I'll blow it up. It says, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers. And we had kind of made it clear that we're going to move back to Prague, and we're hoping to do something new in a church that will help people come to church that maybe haven't been a, plugged into a church for a while. And so someone gave me this book. And I said, the heart of Christ for sinners and sufferers, this book is about the people in Prague. This, this book is about them. Sinners, I know some sinners in Prague. Sufferers, yeah, there's plenty of those in Prague. This book someone gave me is about that, about them. Imagine my surprise when I read the book and guess who it's about. It's about me. First chapter pointed out that I'm a sinner, reminded me of my sin that I'm a sinner and that I need the love of God. Very quickly, it went to how much suffering, right? Like, not like, su- like, like long suffering just in the midst of, of sin and messed around in a world that is not the way that it should be. And I'm reading this book, continually being humbled whenever I thought, I'm going to read this to learn about everybody else. And instead, I'm the sinner, and I'm the sufferer, and I'm the one that is in need of the grace that this book talks about. It's a good book. If you want to borrow it, you should. It's, it's very humbling but life-changing. But we do that, don't we? Whenever we read something spiritual, either in this book or in the Bible, it's like if, if this book said the heart of Christ for humble heroes, I would have been like, this book's about me, right? But sinners and sufferers, well, this book's about someone else. And friends, if, if, if I can be humble, I often read the Bible that same way. When there's a hero, it must be me. And when there's someone doing something wrong, it must be them. But the truth is, when we read our Bible, we should associate ourselves with the trouble. That's who we are in the story. And the hero is usually Jesus. The one I like to point out is, if you look at David and Goliath, and you see David slings this stone and he kills this giant, and you're like, I'm the hero, I'm David. And then you sling a stone and it misses the giant. And you sling 10 stones and the giant's still standing. And you're like, what's the problem? It's because you're not David in the story. You're the Israelites who have been cowered, powerless in their tents, not knowing what to do. And Jesus steps forward as David. He's the hero, and boom, he kills the giant. So if you've been slinging stones at giants, you're not made to kill your giants. Jesus is the one to kill your giants. So when we read the Bible thinking that we're the hero, well, then we mess up because when we fall, we're like, well, what happened? And if we read the Bible saying that we're not the ones in trouble, well, then we're missing out where the hero swoops in to save the day. Whenever there's trouble, when someone's doing something stupid, That's you, (laughs) and that's me. And when there's some hero that comes in and saves the day, that's not you. It's Jesus. So back to this Galatians 6, 7, I'm I'm looking at it, and and God says, God cannot be mocked. And you know what I do? You hear that, everybody? God cannot be mocked. And God taps me on the shoulder. Hey, Wopsle, gets in my face. I, I, I can't be mocked. It's for you, man. I'm not talking to the, all the other mockers out there. You know which mocker I'm talking to, Wopsle? It's you. Because all the rest of Galatians is written to mature believers in the Christ who are supposed to be doing their best to live out of faith that shows other people what the truth is. And Galatians 6, 7, in context, is the same thing written to the same people for the same purpose. Right after this is this description of two different kinds of people. Verses 8 through 10, we'll kind of go through this. It says this. It says, whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Basically, right, it's kind of saying, if you choose to do things your own way, versus if you choose to do things God's way, is what he's saying. It says, let us not become weary in doing good. Isn't that a great scripture? For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, now we always got to stop. Anytime there's a therefore in the Bible, you got to go back and see what the therefore is there for, right? So think about all of Galatians 5 and all of Galatians 6 that we've talked about so far. It's written to Christians that they, that they would be have freedom in Christ. They're equipped by the Holy Spirit, given these gifts and given these fruits so that now they would go out and lovingly and gently restore others. Therefore, in verse 10, as we have opportunity... Let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. 
So see, 8 through 10 is clearly written to mature believers leading in the church. And again, all the other stuff clearly was too. So verse 7 clearly is too. It's an invitation for us to look inward is what this is. It's an invitation for us to think, am I sowing for myself, for my flesh? Am I doing things the way that I want to do them, knowing that God has called me to do them a different way? Or am I sowing for the Spirit? Am I investing for things of God? Are you using the gifts that God has given you to bless others and to bless the church and to gently restore others? Are you just using those gifts for your own self? Here's a friendly reminder. I don't think this is a toe stepper, but it might be, so get ready. Here's a friendly reminder for how to read your Bible. If you feel like a scripture is attacking someone, it isn't. Unless it's you. Here's here's maybe a kinder way to put that. There is an enemy in my life that is actively working against me knowing God, that is working against me being a good husband, that's working against me being a good pastor. I have an enemy that is every single day working really hard to keep me from doing what I need to be doing. And that enemy is Wopsle. It's me. I'm the one in my way. Listen, is there a real adversary out there that's prowling like a roaring lion? Yes, I know that, but let me, t- let me put it this way. Um, I don't skip my quiet time in the morning sometimes because Satan's whispering in my ear. You know why I skip my quiet time sometimes on Sunday mornings? Because I'm already on my phone and I like it more than the Bible, <laughs> right? The algorithms have drawn me in to finish my wordle before I finish my quiet time. It's not the devil, it's me. Do I get angry at my kids sometimes because Satan's whispering in my ears? No. I get angry at my kids sometimes because have you met kids, all kids? It's because I need to grow in my patience. It's not Satan. It's me. Do I neglect showing love to the people in my life that I should show love to because of Satan? No, it's not actually that. It's because I'm selfish. and I'm usually focused on what benefits me. And sometimes if loving people well doesn't benefit me, then I don't do it. Not because Satan convinced me. It's because I convinced me. Sometimes, maybe this is just for me, but I used to have a, a time in my life where I very conveniently forgot to tithe if I was out of town. It's like, well, whoops, can't do anything about that, right? Was that Satan being like, hey, use that money for something stupid? No, that was Wopsle saying, I'm going to use this money for something stupid. This is going to be a great day. So for me, I, th- there is a real adversary. But the adversary's head was crushed with Jesus on the cross. I think we might give him more credit than is due when for me, again, I won't, I won't try to tell every one of you this how you are, but for me, the biggest enemy for me is me. And that's who I am trying to wrangle. Therefore, when I read the Bible, it, I am the one it's trying to help. I'm the one it's trying to cast a light on. I am the mocker that Galatians 6, 7 is trying to warn about, hey, don't mock me. Don't know what you're supposed to do and choose to do something different anyway. It's, it's, it's me. And real quick, I do, I do want to point these two things out. You may say, well, Wopsle, the Bible calls itself a sword, right? The Bible said that's a sword, and that sounds like something you should stab somebody with. Well, hope we're not <laughs> We shouldn't be stabbing anybody. But let me do just real quick point out these two places where the Bible calls itself a sword. Ephesians 6, 14 through 17, you know this, but we'll read it all together. I'll read it to you anyway. It says, stand firm then, right? With the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So I have heard the sermon about all these, these defensive things and why you need to have all these things. And then lastly, they say, but then the sword, that's your only offensive weapon. And if you've heard that sermon, I'm not going to tell you to go back and slap that preacher. But here's what I think is, again, in context, every single thing there is defensive. And then it talks about the sword. And we're like, I, I, I get the sense sometimes as Christians, we're so dying for a weapon to hit other people over the head that we're like, that must be what the sword is for. But let me, let me put it this way. Um, most of you have locks on your doors. Why is that? It's for protection, right? Most of you probably have, maybe, or some of you have some kind of alarm system on your house. What's that for? It's for protection. Um, I know way fewer of you, but some of you have a, a, a pistol in your, your, the bedside table, don't you? What is that for? It's for protection. Yes, it's an offensive weapon, 
But the way that a firearm hopefully is used, like in your bedside at your house, it's not because you're just dying to just get up and start blasting people. It's because it's for protection. It's, it's actually still a, a defensive measure, right? God willing, you never have to take it out and use it. So the fact that Ephesians 6 has all these defensive things, I think the sword of the Spirit, it's more like this. If I can take this word, it says very clearly there, it's the word of God. If I can take this word and I can hide it in my heart, that's like that pistol, I think, hidden in your bedside table. It's, it's actually not meant for offense. I don't need to get God's word in my heart so that I can tell everybody else what God's word says to them. I need to hide God's word in my heart as a protection for when an intruder tries to come into my heart. I've got protection there for it. I've got defenses set up. So can the sword of the spirit be used to fight the devil? I mean, I, I think so. But again, for me, I need, no, I need a weapon against myself. And that's what I think the word of God is meant to be. And the other one that we, we went through a whole lot this last, back in May. So you can go back and look at the whole, whole sermon we preached in Hebrews 4.12. But this is what it said. It said, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So again, sometimes someone there is like, see, I've got this sword. I'm supposed to be penetrating people, dividing their soul and their spirit and all that. But again, it's not an attacking kind of sword. If you remember what we talked about, and you may already know this, many translations of, your, of, of our Bibles, instead of double-edged sword, they use the word scalpel. Because it's not saying we need to know this Bible and take it and cut other people with it. It's saying the word of God is meant to cut deep into our hearts, like a scalpel, like a surgeon. The only time we see Jesus interacting with a sword at all, you know, Jesus had one guy that was a zealot that followed him around, if you remember, his name was Simon. And Simon, like, was a guy that fought people with swords a lot in the name of, of the Lord. And then he started following Jesus. And every day he was dying, Jesus, can we please pick up swords? Like, I'm so trained, I'm ready, I'm dying, let's cut, cut some people. Well, the other Simon, Simon Peter, the only time we see Jesus interact with the sword is whenever the people came to arrest Jesus, right? These guys have been following Jesus around for three years. They know him. They love him. They've seen him do so many great things. And now someone comes and tries to arrest Jesus, and Simon Peter cuts off his ear with a sword. I got to think some of the disciples were like, it's finally time to go. Let's do this, right? We've been waiting for this forever. And instead of Jesus saying, let's strike, he gets mad at Peter. He picks up the dude's ear, and he puts it right back on. Because Jesus wasn't about attacking people with swords. He had every right to do that so many times in his life, and he never did. And so when we look at the word of God as being the sword, I don't think it's meant to be an attack sword. I think it's meant to be a defense sword. I think it's meant to be a scalpel, to not for me to cut into your heart, but for the Lord to cut into my heart. So this Galatians 6, 7 about mocking, it's not a stone that we get to throw to somebody else. It's a mirror to help us reflect. It says God cannot be mocked. You know what our response needs to be? Are there any areas in my life where the way that I'm living is mocking God? Not for you to use it to convince other people to stop mocking God, but for you to do the hard work to see if there's areas where your lifestyle is mocking God. And what can you do to do that heart work to do better? Let's pray together, church. God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that many times it comes and it is so encouraging and it's about your love and it's so uplifting. And God, in the same breath, we thank you that so many times your word comes in and it cuts deep. God, it's like iron sharpening iron. It's loud and it's hot and it's hammering. God, we thank you that your word is both of those things to us. God, we pray that we would find um, equal parts encouragement as much as we do correction because we, God, we all have so many um, refinements to go through. We have so many rough edges that need knocked off, not so that we will look prettier for this world, God, but so that we can be better servants of you. God, we thank you for the freedom that we have in your son. We thank you for the life that we get to live because of the empowerment of your Holy Spirit. So God, we ask that you would send us out to lovingly and gently restore others. God, we invite you to point out to us the areas that we are mocking you, the areas that we are holding back, the areas that we are living to please our flesh instead of sowing into the Spirit. God, we ask that you would reveal those things to us so that we could humbly receive them. 
and change them to better reflect your kingdom. God, we love you. We honor you today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, friends. Well, let me give you this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Hey, around here, we're about two things, loving God as a community. That's what we've been doing and loving people in our community. Let's go out there and do that this week. See you Wednesday or Thursday or Sunday.